of truth. And uh, it's just as a concept. Uh, the Greek word is aletheia, and it's a beautiful word, and, and the, the concept itself is an absolutely beautiful concept. So that's what we're going to think about in our class period this morning. We'll get back to some lessons on John as we get back to our regular schedule. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for the way you bless us. We ask, Father, that you be especially with uh, Case and Sydney and Magnolia May and pray, Father, that they uh, continue to get uh, uh, to have a wonderful life. We ask, Father, that you be with us today as we study thy word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We, we toss that verse off. That's one of those verses that we, we toss off, you know, kind of like we know that. We understand that. And uh, we, we've got that down. But the fact is, in our world today, the concept of truth is uh, under, I wouldn't say under attack, but it's in a situation where it's being challenged. And I, we're going to talk about truth from the biblical point of view. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 23, to buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom, instruction, and understanding. So one of the unique things about being a human being is the ability to absorb information, to categorize that information in our minds and allow that information to be beneficial to us. It's a fascinating study of how the mind works, uh, how we come to know what we know. And most of the time when we study that subject, we find that the way our minds work, and this sometimes is easier to see in an area like engineering or mathematics, uh, medicine, things like that, where there is uh, a certain amount of objectivity that's apparent on the surface. But actually, truth is that way. Two plus two is four applies right across the board in terms of the objective nature of truth. It's just harder to discover in, in other areas other than that which uh, represented by objective entities. But the mind works by absorbing, it seems to me anyway, the mind works by absorbing reality and categorizing that reality. In other words, putting things, If I like to think about it this way, and I got this idea from a fellow named John Locke, who was an English philosopher, he was born in 1632, and he was uh, he had sort of a Christian perspective. I don't I don't think he was a New Testament Christian, but he was had a Christian perspective, and um, he he wrote a book called The Essay on Human Understanding, and that was uh, a seminal book in terms of the approach that people took in the early days of the Reformation movement. Well, he's before the Reformation really got cranked up, but well, he's in the early part of it, and so. But in that book, he talked about the fact the way we come to know what we know about anything really is by uh, creating in our minds categories and placing things in those categories so they can be systematized in our own mind. I know that sounds like a kind of an in-depth uh, approach to the, to the matter, but just think about how do we know what we know? How do we know what we know? Uh, Locke was also, by the way, uh, responsible for a lot of the thought forms and idea sets that ended up creating uh, the uh, United States. The Declaration of Independence, of course, was written by Thomas Jefferson, but uh, he, he relied heavily on another book by John Locke called, uh, uh, well, it was two essays on uh, the understanding of uh, political interaction. So, uh, the whole idea of how we know truth, how we know anything, is uh, by virtue of category, uh, that we divide things up in our minds and, and proceed forth with that information. It's, like, it's, it's just like anything else, uh, to illustrate it in the simplest way, on the way up here this morning, uh, I'm driving along on uh, you know, 127 and 166, and... Uh, 
coming up and the the road cleaners were out this morning. You know who the road cleaners are? The buzzards were out. I mean, there was stuff on the side of the road and the buzzards were just going after it. And uh, they've gotten, I've noticed over the years, they've gotten, they've gotten brave. They only move if you're coming right at them. So, you know, but that's, you know, I, there's a category in my mind. If I see those buzzards flying around, I'm going to be looking for something on the road that has been killed, and that's what they're there for. They're there to clear that up. And that's a simplistic way of understanding that we categorize things and keep those memories in mind and use that information in the future. Now, the Bible is the truth that makes us free. And if we look, uh, there's a number of passages that uh, we can look at that are, uh, I think, I, to me, they give me a great joy. I hope they give you joy, too, because uh, the, these things are, are just uh, tremendously encouraging to think about. And one such passage is uh, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10, where Paul, at the end of this letter, this magnificent letter about the church and a oneness in Christ, he says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, this is Ephesians 6, 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You notice he says spiritual wickedness in high places. In our study of the book of John, we have taken pains to point out the fact that John is interested in teaching people that spiritual reality is more important than material reality. That's not to diminish the importance of understanding our physical world and our physical selves and so forth, but the spiritual life is uh, superior. And it's superior because it lasts past that which is material. And so we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know, we, you know, if you're a wrestler, you wrestle against flesh and blood. If you're an athlete, you wrestle against flesh and blood. But he's not talking about that kind. If you're a soldier, if you're a, uh, uh, somebody in law enforcement, you wrestle against flesh and blood. And you have to. You're supposed to. Romans 13 and other places. However... Spiritually, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against uh, rulers of darkness. In other words, Satan and his, his cronies. In order, to, in order to be able to do that effectively, in order to do that effectively, he says in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Now here he uses a picture familiar to anybody in Ephesus. Because Ephesus uh, is in Asia Minor, of course, but it's under the control of the Roman Empire. And the reason, the, w the way that Rome kept control of its provinces was by having its military have a presence in each one. And so the figure of a Roman soldier is something these people would be familiar with. So he says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, now, this is not armor like medieval England, that clanky stuff you see in the movies. This is actual effective armor that the Romans devised for their soldiers. And this was stuff they could move in. This was stuff they could fight in. But this is also stuff that would afford them uh, the best protection that would be possible to have in those days and those circumstances. And it comes out in this passage. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now, this is the thing in ancient warfare based on you know what you read in the history books since none of us were there, but in ancient warfare, it was the last man standing. The last man standing was the winner. And they knew that not everybody was going to make it through these battles. So this concept of standing is a very important one and familiar to anybody that lived in that day and that time. So he says, stand therefore, 
having your loins girt about with truth. Now, your loins girt about with truth. That part of the armor would cover the lower leg and the upper, the lower torso, so that that would be protected as much as possible. And this was generally done with, uh, sometimes it would be done with uh, metal plates, but oftentimes it was just done with heavy leather and that sort of thing, something that would deflect a blow, uh, diminish the uh, impact of a blow on somebody. So, so your loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. And so he's talking about using this figure of this armor, but he's, he's talking about spiritual elements associated with it. He, he's talking about uh, uh, truth uh, protecting you. Your loins girt about with truth. Truth protects us. It's just, you know, we, we, we know that in everyday life, we know that uh, if we ignore what's true and right, we'll be in trouble. I mean, you know, it's, it's true that if you drive too fast, you may have a, an automobile wreck. You may wreck your automobile. If we ignore that truth, we get ourselves into trouble. Uh, if you use a firearm in an unsafe fashion, you might hurt somebody. You might hurt yourself. Truth. So the loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, if you're a soldier, you do not want to get hit in the middle of the chest. Because, uh, you know, the middle of your chest right over here is your heart. If you get hit in the right place, and particularly a punctured type wound, you're, you're a goner. But what protects us? Well, righteousness. How, where do you learn righteousness? Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes it is you first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God, what? Revealed. The righteousness of God revealed. And so the truth reveals righteousness. And he says, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now the gospel of peace is a description of the gospel, which is revealed in God's word, Romans 1, 16. Your feet shod, you know, if, you, if your feet get hurt and you're in a battle, you're, you're out of business. You can't go anywhere. And, uh, you know, we all know as we get a little bit older, if our feet hurt, everything hurts just about. And so he says, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace will help us. And then he says in verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, uh, not every Roman soldier uh, carried a shield because it depended on what, on what their job was, which role that they uh, were, were in, uh, involved in. But the shield of faith... He says, wherewith you be able to shield, uh, quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The, the, the shield of faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The shield of faith is the faith that we learn and practice and make part of our lives from God's word. Now, I know you've heard this before and uh, you've studied all of this before. A group like this has studied their Bibles for many, many years. But this shield of faith that quenches the fiery darts of the wicked, if, if a soldier's job was to be sort of in the front lines and to deflect the initial blow of the enemy's darts, uh, arrows, arrows, and they could, they sometimes would shoot at each other in those days, darts that had the, the ends of them were equipped with a substance that would allow them to burn. And so they'd have a literal fiery dart, a literal fiery dart. And the, the shield, there were shields, the technology of that day allowed for a shield to be designed and built that would quench those darts. And it wouldn't quench them just by stopping them. If you got it in the right place, you could stop it. But it would quench them because they would take uh, metal, on the outside and put inside, take a sandwich with metal on either side. And then uh, on the, in the middle between those two parts of metal, just like a sandwich, you would put wood. And it would be a wood that would, uh, that would soak up water. You know, like I can imagine, you know, there are a lot of woods that will absorb water and you can prepare that shield for battle 
so that when it gets hit by a dart, a fiery dart, that it puts, it puts the fire out. Well, I don't know how effective that was, but based on the, the history that I've been able to read about it, of course, never seen one in action, thankfully, but to quench all the fiery darts of the wick. What reminds us, however, though, that in our lives, the truth of God's word, and that's what Ephesians 6 through uh, 10 uh, through 18 is about, our lives, we're continually under attack. Uh, not by the people in this room, but by, by people in the world that uh, don't believe the truth and, and are not interested in the principles and the things that we live by that we gain from God's Word. And sometimes what they throw at you is a fiery dart. And how do you, how do you defend yourself? Well, with the shield of faith. And that's, that's what it's about. You know, this, every day you, you run into a situation that people say, well, you know, I just, uh, you know, we got so much going on in our world today, this, uh, this woke culture, you know, this cancel culture, and we have uh, this, uh, the LBGTQ, whatever it is these days, whatever's popular these days, this kind of uh, crowd that... Uh, presents ideas that if you disagree with them that you're a dirty dog and all of that and um, you know they're shooting these fiery darts and how do you quench them well you you can't you can't uh, uh, pardon that's what it is that's right it's censorship that's exactly right and so uh, they want to censor the truth and the only way to stand against that is to take the shield of faith and quench those fiery darts of the wicked. And, of course, I've done a little of that. With, I've, I've tried to do that with people you know, that I find in that situation. And, and uh, they talk to you, and uh, I say, well, what do you think about an alternative view to what you are saying here? If you think, for example, that just because you decide that you're, you're a man, you want to be a woman, or you're a woman, you want to be a man. How do you make that change? I mean, it's, let's go back to the concept of truth and how, how we come to know anything. How do you know anything? You observe the reality that's before you, place it in the category. And categorically, there's only two kinds of people. They're men and they're women. Now, I know that you can have a, a medical aberration. You can have a physical aberration. Somebody turns out the other way. And if a person is placed in an environment that uh, they're taught the wrong thing from birth on, they're going to end up thinking the wrong thing. You know, how you, how you end up thinking what's wrong is to be taught what's wrong and keep on being taught it. So we have to stand against the fiery darts of the wicked. And then verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So we have the helmet of salvation, uh, which protects the, the head, and, you know, the head's of extreme. Say, 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 it, say it again, please. I think the two things go together. Staying saved does keep your mind right. Well, you got to keep your mind right and stay saved, don't you? That's right. Fits together. But anyway, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But never forget, never forget that the tool that we use in our battles is not a physical one. You know, over the years of the existence of the Christian religion in its many forms, People have said, well, we, we believe what's right and true, and therefore we're going to fight for it physically. You have the crusade, you have a number of things that have come along. And we have people today in our world who, who do that. I mean, that's, that's one of the problems with the most extreme element of those in the Muslim faith. They, they believe in a physical warfare being justified in order to conquer the world and so forth and Christians Christian people of a Christian heritage have done that too uh, over the years you know and uh, you know it used to be uh, uh, it, used, 
you know, there's a little bit of this, this whole what it used to be is not all bad. People used to really feel strongly about what they believed the Bible taught, and they would, they would talk. Now, sometimes they'd argue about it too firmly and without the right spirit. You've always got to maintain the spirit of God, spirit of Christ, spirit of love when you're talking to people. Uh, but I remember uh, I read in the Restoration period of time about a man named Raccoon John Smith. If, if you ever heard of Raccoon John Smith, would you please raise your hand? All right. Raccoon John Smith, this was in a day when the preachers were just a little bit more raw-boned <laughs> than they are now, you know, a little bit tougher in some ways. And when they would be on the road, they would have to stay in uh, wherever they could stay. And the story goes, and this was told to me by Brother Earl West, who wrote In Search for the Ancient Order. There's three or four volumes of that. Brother West said that, uh, that Raccoon John Smith came into a roadhouse and uh, was sitting at the, at the bar. I don't, I don't know if he was drinking or not, but he was sitting at the bar having something to eat. And sitting next to him was a Methodist preacher. Have you all heard this story? So he's sitting next to him is a Methodist preacher. And, and John, Raccoon John Smith was evidently a tough guy. And he looked at that guy and he said, you know, just me, imagine me sitting next to Brother Britton looking at him and saying, now listen, you know what? I believe I'm going to take you outside down to the creek and I'm going to baptize you for the remission of your sin. And the Methodist preacher looked at him and said, well, it wouldn't, you can't do that. He said, well, I can. I'm man enough to do it, and I'm going to do it. And the fellow said, you can't do that because if you do that and it's against my will, it won't do me any good. And Smith told the fellow, told the Methodist preacher, he said, well, what about all those babies you've been baptizing? You don't know whether that's against their will or not because they're too young to have a will. He was, he was uh, taught them a lesson on infant baptism. So we look, sometimes we have to use our heads when we're in this battle. But we also need to remember verse 18, which says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication with the saints. Study your word, put the word in its right place, but remember to pray. We're going to talk about prayer this morning in our in our worship service this morning uh, we need to remember to pray but let's think a little bit more about truth in the, in the time we have left truth is in God's word truth is authoritative and it, the authority of truth proceeds from its source and the source of truth is is God and that's where the authority of truth comes from. The authority doesn't come from, from us. We are conveyors of the truth, but not the source of the truth. Uh, the Bible authorizes things in a number of different ways. It can be a specific, direct statement. You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. That's a statement, a fact. Uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall That's right. That's right. It's all of it's conditional. The brother makes a point. Uh, the truth is here. It's objective. It's real. But it's conditioned for its benefit to, to accrue to an individual. It has to be believed and obeyed. That's the conditions upon which we move forward in truth. But when we look at the Bible, we see that the Bible reveals truth sometimes in a declarative way, in an interrogative way, or an imperative way, and by implication, and so forth. Now, the value of truth, this is where we get back to Proverbs 23 and verse 23, which says, buy the truth and sell it not. Can you think of examples of, of someone who uh, might have had an opportunity to do that, to buy the truth and sell it not? but didn't follow through. Uh, 
I think sometimes of, of Pharaoh. He listened, he heard the truth. Let my people go, is what Moses said. I think of Pilate. Now, Pilate was uh, an individual who was uh, not an ignoramus. He was a smart fellow. He couldn't have got in the job that he got without having a certain level of intelligence. But he, he, uh, the truth was there. He didn't buy it, and he didn't keep it. To sell it not means you buy it and you keep it. Now, then you have somebody like Demas, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world and is departed, into Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, and Titus unto Dalmatia. So here's the situation, for instance, Demas. I hope Demas came back, but Demas uh, loved this present world. He had the truth, and then he left it. He, he, he couldn't keep it. We can't buckle under. I think that's a lesson for us as New Testament Christians these days, we cannot allow the pressures of this life to cause us to buckle under to whatever's going on. That expression that we all know in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 where it says, Be thou faithful unto death. You see, those people were in actual danger of death if they, if they uh, went against the Roman Empire uh, too firmly. And so you, you know they couldn't do that. And so... In Revelation chapter 2, uh, in verse, uh, let's see where I want to start here. Verse 8, uh, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. The, the introductory to each one of these sections in, the, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the introductory gives us some indication of certain characteristics of the Lord, the source of the word. He said, I know thy works, tribulation, poverty, thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of those which say there are Jews and are not under the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Then he says, it's in that context... Then he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, that's not just a, a saying that keeps us faithful. If, when we set it in the, in the context of the history of the church at Smyrna here in Asia Minor, these people were in actual danger of, of persecution. Now, I don't know. I can imagine. I've tried not to, but I can imagine. Sometimes it's forced upon us when we pay too close attention to the media. I can't imagine us getting into a position where we are physically in danger. Somebody said, well, what if, what if the government comes in? Uh, for instance, uh, I was preaching a lesson on, uh, on homosexuality. Well, it wasn't, the whole lesson wasn't on that. It was just a lesson that included something about that. And uh, the next week, we were off of Facebook uh, at Hop Street. Just, we're off Facebook. And when our guys, uh, they're not supposed to do that, by the way, in a religious, you're supposed to be able to say what you want to say, even if it goes against the, the current uh, uh, supposedly woke truth or so forth. And what they said when we checked into them was, no, you were using, you were using recorded a cappella music without the copyright. And uh, our guys that were in charge of all that, one of the elders and a couple of the technical guys like y'all got here, they said, no, we don't have, we don't use any recorded a cappella music. That's our people singing. Well, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe that you could have singing like that, like y'all singing here is terrific. You, they didn't believe you could have singing like that without it being recorded. And so they went through the machinations of proving to Facebook that no, that's just the way it is. And evidently somebody finally found out that uh, in Limestone County and probably in Giles County too, I'm sure, that you could go to Walmart and get up a singing on any aisle and be enough people that knew about acapella music that could sing with you and make a joyful noise. They finally gave us our, our 
our license back or whatever you call it. And he goes, you know, we, we pay it all. So what you have, you, you buy the truth and you sell it not. But see, that's a little persecution. That's nothing. That's really nothing compared to what some people have had to deal with in history. And that's what, it, that's what John's trying to prepare. Jesus is trying to prepare through the writing of John these people at Smyrna. Be thou faithful unto death. Uh, there, and, and don't miss this now. And I'm not overstating the case. I've been in conversations with people who are from the extreme elements of uh, culture that's completely contrary to the will of God. Not only on the left, listen to me, not only on the left, but on what we call the far right. And their view is people who disagree with us, whether it's out on the right or the left, whichever direction, people who disagree with us ought to be shot. And you've seen in the media, you've seen evidence of folks, you know, you know, here's a bunch of people that I don't agree with, and they're probably doing something very, very wrong. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to run over them with a truck. All right? Pardon? Murder. Murder. Now, see, we can't do that. Well, that's what a liar is, though. Don't want to hear the truth. But thing is, the point is, the Christians, we need to respond. We need to understand it. We may be pressed to the point of uh, death, but we still buy the truth and we sell it not. We, there, uh, there's no reason in the world for us to ever give up. We have to buy all the truth. Truth is necessary, and. I, 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 I'm trying to encourage you to think about the idea that truth is a beautiful thing. Uh, to believe the truth, you know, some reject all of the truth, but to believe all of the truth, that is, it's in God's Word. Now, we, that doesn't mean, doesn't mean that we know everything in the Bible exactly correctly, because I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I'm an old fella, and I'm still learning. I haven't arrived, have you? I haven't arrived at the place where I know everything, and I can explain everything. And I'll tell you what I do. If I run up on something that I can't explain, I keep on studying it. But there's plenty in the Bible that's just laid out there so clear and beautiful and perfect. We need to buy the truth and sell it not. You know, old, old Paul if there's anybody who ever had a situation where uh, it might be in some people's minds uh, justified for him to give up, it would be the Apostle Paul. Uh, you, but he's not the only one. Think about old Jeremiah. And we're going to talk about Daniel this morning a little bit later. Think about the, the fact that they held on to the truth even in st stressful circumstances. Paul said, I'm never ready to be offered. I, I love this passage. I know we talk about it all the time. But Always has been. The last time started at the cross. The last time started when the church was established. We live in the last days. The, this is the last dispensation of the relationship between God and man. And there are going to be periods and times of persecution. There have been periods and times of persecution since the time of the cross, since the early days of the Christian faith. And they will continue to be. And today, the persecution that we experience and is a challenge to the truth is more subtle than it was in times past, and therefore more difficult to defend against because uh, we, we have convinced ourselves in some instances that we're so smart that we know what's going on in every detail. The fact of the matter is that uh, phys uh, physical persecution is not much of a problem in the United States of America, but it is in a lot of places. As a matter of fact, I'll give you an example. 
that you don't, don't you say, well, I'm looking to be persecution. No, there is persecution. The truth is persecuted. In Ghana, which is in West Africa, in the northern part of Ghana, around the town of Yendi, uh, Hop Street supports a missionary family that's over there, been over there for many, many years, one of the early ones. There was a... Uh, Usually what, what's done in that environment is that a native person, and these are very intelligent people, these Africans, a native person is trained in the ability to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was one such a gentleman named John Kabunja, and he was a, a very slight man. He was tall. He was very thin, but he was very brilliant very smart fella. And uh, he would go into the villages and uh, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he preached it so effectively and so, so uh, continually that people would believe it. And, of course, the missionaries there, they did things to uh, benefit the preaching of the gospel. That is, take care of children, help children, that sort of thing. It, it all kind of a program that worked together. But the preaching was usually done by the native preacher. And, and Brother John was one of those individuals. Well, he would go into a community and the people who would obey the gospel. I, I've been out there with them sometimes. I've only been over there twice, but out there with them sometimes. And you, you gathered around a big fire. That was providing the light. There was no light because there's no electricity. We would bring kerosene lights and that sort of thing, some electric lights, but, uh, you know, you were, you were out there. You were in the bush, as they call it, you know. And so people would be baptized. You'd take them down to the river. They'd be baptized. Uh, I remember one time John was in the uh, river baptizing people. And uh, he was a rare African in that he had hairy legs. A lot of them don't. He had little hairy legs and, and little tiny hairy legs. And he said, the fish are biting me. The fish are biting me. He was out there baptizing people. And so in, in some of these villages where the gospel was preached, the main thing you were preaching against, if you want to call it that, was idol worship. Because be, people over there believed in juju. Yeah, I have only one foot. Use the other. That's correct. That's correct. But the point is, of course, persecution. And so John would preach the truth, and it would upset the local shaman or witch doctor and those people are very powerful in the minds of the people around there that's why you have to buy the truth so it not and what ended up happening was that john john was poisoned to death people slipped poison into his food some of these witch doctors did and our folks there believe without fail that his life was taken because he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't happen here every day. The only thing we have to put up with here is, is people saying things that aren't right or people with a bad attitude or people with big egos or whatever it is that gets in our way. But the fact is, uh, the, the truth of uh, God's word, it's God's light, it's God's seed, it's his hammer, his power, it's his sword. Uh, the truth will make us free and will keep us free. Well, that's about our time for this morning. We'll, we'll uh, suspend the class at the moment and we'll gather back in just a few moments to begin our worship service. Thank you for your attention today.